of the global movement that promotes peace and the old values on this big, beautiful Okay, hey everyone, welcome, welcome, welcome. Let's fix a few little things up. Let's do that. How's that looking? Welcome, welcome. Happy Wednesday, 2 p.m. Okay, Stephen, I checked again. It was 1080p. When I stopped streaming, it was 10, it, the option was set to 1080p. Um, I have no idea why it changes when I go live. I think it's like using recommended settings based off my network. So if anyone's an expert with this stuff, any pro Twitch streamers in the chat, and you want to help me improve the quality of the stream, um, yeah, get in touch. Because <laughs> I'm trying to fix it, but maybe my upload speed's not fast enough for it to do 1080, so... Um, yeah, I did try. Um, Sienna, yeah, no midterms, yeah. Okay, while we get into it, there's a few little housekeeping things I wanted to talk about. So I've made a playlist for all the lecture content um, in order. Um, is this the public URL? Or is this like a... Yeah. Um, so you can see, I don't know, some people asked for it. So there you go. There's a lecture playlist. I'll make sure it's up to date and kept in the correct order and all that stuff. Um, that might need to refresh. I think I changed a few things. No, nope, that's fine. So there's that. Um, okay. Project leaderboard is live. How exciting. Um, that's an awful spot for the camera. So I'll just do a brief descrip dis description, description over um, how to sort of interpret this. So you all should have received two emails <laughs> with um, your group alias. The second being the actual email with the correct group alias, yeah. Um, so you basically can look up your group alias, you know, in this, in the leaderboard um, to see where you're placing in terms of the course. So um, we've already sort of described how the leaderboard is working, but I'll just go through it again. Um, basically, the way we mark, or the way some part of the uh, group project is auto-marked is based off the um, tests, the test suite. The test suite, and this has all been discussed in the introductory video, which is the, the green videos in the playlist. But basically, um, you write your own tests, we have our own tests, we multiply those together, and that's the final auto-marking um, 
That's the final auto marking score for the for the each iteration. This runs this t times i. We run this after the project is due, right? The leaderboard is us running the exact same tests, but far more often. So you can just see how well you're doing um, compared to the rest of the course. You can see how well your code is running, um, how close you are, if you're making improvements, if you're making regressions, etc. So it's just a bit of a bit of you know insight into how your project's going. And we can see there's already some amazing effort from one group that looks like they're quite close, not perfect. So we have some uh, course tests that must be failing because they're not, you know, in the 90 to 100 range here. But um, yeah, some good progress here. And then lots of groups that haven't actually got started yet, it looks like. So now some notes here. This only runs on the main branch, the master branch. So if you haven't pushed code to the master branch yet, it's not going to be running. It doesn't run in real time. I think it runs every morning or something like that. So it can take a bit of a delay for it to show up here, right? Um, so don't don't stress about anything like that. Um, and this is not your actual mark, right? This is just um, the 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 sort of you know interim mark. We will run it again properly on the master branch after the deadline's due. So don't say like, oh crap, like I only got a thirty to forty. It's like no, no, no. This this will keep running. Um, Um, if anything, wait, is anything meant to come up when you search your team? Yeah. So you have to search your group alias, not your, not your team, like tutorial time plus name group. The reason we've got the alias is just so it's more anonymous. So you can't go figure out what other people in other groups have. Right. So it's all random. So you should have received an email um, with your alias. Um, if the master pipeline isn't successful, do you lose marks? What do you mean by the pipeline isn't successful? Uh, for iteration one, it's only the auth channel and channels files. That, yeah, so we're only testing what we say we're going to test in iteration one's spec. So we're not doing anything tricky. We're not out to get you. Um, we're just, you know, the spec is actually very mature for this project. So if you, if you know what we're telling you, we're testing in the iteration one test, that's all we're testing here. Um, yeah, so you want to get your, your master branch, the tests need to be passing you know, before it's merged in, right? If the tests aren't passing, your, like your local tests, then your score, your group test score is going to be low. So you definitely want to do, make sure that. And another tip with this is do not push a bunch of changes, you know, right before the, the deadline of the, uh, of the project without really making sure that you're not going to cause any issues. You know, you haven't accidentally pushed a mistake that's going to cause issues with the test. But with anything like this, if you speak to your tutor, if you speak to me, we're, we're on your side and we'll, we'll sort it out. Um, so I don't know, it's working well for me. Maybe give it a, a hard refresh or open in a private tab if you're not seeing the data. Um, it does say please view on full screen on a computer. So don't use your phone, it looks like. Um, um, we don't test your testing functions, Justin. No, I don't think it would be really possible to do that. Where do we access the leaderboard? Great question. Here's the link. And yeah, it was in your email as well. Doesn't work on Safari, only Chrome. Yeah, it's cool. I mean, this is like just a, yeah, we really didn't sort of need to, to, to build this leaderboard, but um, big thanks to Emily, one of the course admins who, you know, took some time to write a little React app. This is what this is. So yeah, it's not a perfect system. It's not a perfect tool, but we don't really need it. It's just something extra for you guys. So you can, you can have a bit more certainty over where you are. So any more questions on the leaderboard? It's a pretty cool, it's pretty cool to have something like this, I think. And it's all, you know, anonymous and it's nice. So yeah, hopefully it's a little bit of motivation. If you're one of the groups that haven't really gotten started on your project yet, um, to really start, you know, pushing stuff and making sure you're familiar over everything that you're doing and, um, 
and getting some tests passing and stuff. Cool. Um, so the leaderboard runs once a day. I think. Something like that. I think it's like 9am or something. Um, Pernjay, what if some members are not contributing at all? This is something that can happen and does happen. Um, all I can say, and I've said this in the past and I'll say it again, um, we are on your side. Yes, it's a group project. You have individual marks. We can scale individual, individual members' marks. But if this is happening, the best thing you need to do is talk to your team member and talk to your tutor. Please, 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 please. This goes to everyone. Please listen to this. This will help you immensely. If you're having problems with your group, tell your tutor now as early as you can tell them so that they know. What's really frustrating for us, and this happened to me last term, is when, you know, you hear all the problems after the iteration is due. And I think, well, but it's too late for me to help you now because I didn't know. If I knew, I could have intervened, spoken to the student, told them to leave the course, um, helped you guys out. But it's really important that you, you tell your tutor if you're having issues. Um, the student might have withdrew and we don't know. So it's really, really, really important. If you're not getting anything from them, please... Um, please reach out to them and then please reach out to your tutor. And if you're not happy with how that's going, reach out to me, but do that, do that last. Um, how do we find our team? We haven't seen the aliases. It, your, your alias was emailed to you. If you didn't get the email, let me know. I think four emails didn't go through. So you could be one of the lucky four. Um, do we get scaled up if our group only has three members? I really don't want three member groups, but sometimes it's not avoidable. So maybe contact me individually about that and I'll get in touch with your tutor. Yeah, ideally we don't want three member groups. I'll think about what we do in terms of scaling. No, so this form, you can just go to the URL, but you just won't know your alias unless you check your email. I mean, the other thing you can do is check your commit hash. So you can, I don't know if you can search for the commit hash. No, you can't. You'd have to like, I don't know you could do that. I don't know how you would do that, but you could find your commit hash. But I emailed all 700 of you, your group aliases yesterday. But the URL is public. Once you know your group, or you can ask your group members. Each of you got emailed the group alias. Okay, I think that's enough talk about the leaderboard. Um, any other group project issues, please talk to your tutor about them ASAP. Please, please, please. That's really important. It'll help you out. Alrighty. All right, that's all looking good. Okay, let's get on to the actual content or one half of the content for this week. Week three, lecture four, um, ver testing, verification, and validation. And um, TZ or TZ, whatever your alias or name is there, um, I'm actually going to be talking about all of the stuff that you're asking about in this lecture. So... Don't, don't worry. Okay, so verification and validation. This is a bit more of a theoretical lecture today, um, but I'm going to make sure that I really talk about a lot of the things that I think and I know about from industry um, so that you can get a lot of value out of this lecture as well as get a, a bit of understanding um, about sort of why we do sort of things and the different ways we can test. So this is all in the software development lifecycle stream of, of lecture. So what are we going to be doing today? We're going to be talking about the different paradigms and, and concepts of testing um, conceptually. And we'll do a bit of practical stuff at the end. Um, but specifically, we're going to be looking at verification, um, both static and dynamic, and then as well, uh, validation. So these are two broad groups of sort of testing in the software development lifecycle process. So first of all, let's start with a definition of both verification and validation. And I think anytime you come across um, a slide where it's like a definition, it's probably really good to um, take notes, right? Because this is the type of stuff that gets asked in exams and, and things like this. So there's a bit of a hint there. So these are the ISO um, IEEE standard definitions. So we don't write these. These come from an international um, body. So what is verification? Verification is a system lifecycle context in a, a set of activities that compare a product of the system against its required characteristics. Okay, what the hell does that mean? 
Um, basically, it's like getting into the internals of it of a system technically and verifying that it works as we expect. Okay, and then on the other hand, we have validation. Um, validation is a system life cycle, is a set of activities ensuring that and gaining confidence that a system is able to accomplish its intended use, goals, and objectives. So let's get rid of all the jargon, all the technicality. Verification is making sure that a system is, has been built correctly. It's working. It's doing what we wanted it to do. Validation is making sure that we, te we created the right thing in the first place. Another way to think of it is verification is like the qualita uh, quantitative testing. Validation is like the qualitative testing. Um, you know, I spoke about, I think in week one, when I introduced... Um, this course and I and I mentioned that 50% of software projects fail. Do you guys remember that that statistic? It's a pretty jarring statistic the first time you hear it. 50% of software projects fail. That's the typical um, reported number. Maybe it's changed recently in the last few years, but that's where it's currently sitting at. Not all of these software projects failed because the software engineers weren't, you know, capable enough to program the right things. That's not why the majority of software projects fail. The major I posit the majority of software projects fail because the wrong thing was built. Um, here is a, another way of sort of framing this. It's called the XY problem. I'm not sure if anyone's heard of this. Um, let me just make this a bit smaller. The XY problem is a putting sort of a term to the idea that a lot of us probably already have in our heads. I've seen this so many times. I see this on the forum with you guys in industry, with users, with programmers. What, so what is the XY problem? It's when we want to do something, we have a problem, right? And we don't know how to go about the problem. But rather than trying to understand our problem really well, um, we jump to a solution. And we hyper fixate on, oh, if I just know how to solve this problem, then all my problems in X will be solved. But when we go and ask for help and when we go and create the solution, when we go and build things, we're, we're still focusing on that why, but we haven't taken a step back and thought about what our actual problem is. Maybe the solution is a non-technical solution. Maybe the solution is a business process change. Um, and what we find out in the end after maybe an entire project is that finally it becomes clear that um, Y was never actually the correct path to go about solving problem X. Um, there is some other solution. Um, so having this concept in mind is what a validation is all about. But I think just in general, if you can take this away from this course, you'll be really well served by this idea if you keep this in mind. If someone's telling you, hey, I've got a problem in my code, this isn't working, I just, I really need to fix it. Sometimes the solution is to take a step back and say, we shouldn't even be doing this. Maybe we can solve it another way. So that's the X, Y problem. Um, and there's some examples here. This is a nice little website on it. So there's the link in the chat. Um, so from my perspective, we, we've spoken about verification a lot before. That's our typical sort of pie test testing the code, making sure that the function I've written does what it says or does what I think it should be doing. Validation, this, this is more you know, related to the XY problem. Did I even go about building the right thing? So if you look at this, this group project uh, seams that you're, that you're all building, maybe we should never have even built it. Obviously, this is a course and we want to, we want to build it, <laughs> right? But uh, maybe you're going about, your, you're creating a software project to solve a problem, but you're not actually solving the problem. Um, and that's what validation is all about. So let's talk about verification again um, and break it down a little bit. So there's, there's two types. Um, static verification. Now we spoke about static analysis yesterday. So static verification is utilizing static analysis techniques to test and verify our, our code and our projects. So, for example, linting is a form of static verification. We're making sure that the, um, you know, after a static analysis of our code, that it's looking the way it should, it's formatted the way it should. Um, and there's, there's more to it. We'll talk about some other techniques in a, in a moment. Um, but that's the, the idea. And then we have dynamic verification. Why is it dynamic? Because we actually will execute the code. 
So we're running the code. This is your PyTest, right? Um, we, we call the functions you've written and test that they return the correct thing. And these are both forms of verification. Um, so static verification is usually considered more robust and reliable form of testing. Um, however, in many cases, we need to dynamically verify code too. So there's more to static verification than just linting. So we have style, sure, type checking. Um, so this is something that we, we do in languages like Python and in something like TypeScript. The type checking that happens in these languages, now we haven't done Python with types, we'll do it a little bit in a later lecture, but we can actually, we can actually try and infer some information about um, type assignments in Python statically, and then we can raise issues if we're coming across an issue that we don't like. And we can actually do some logic checking. So some anti-pattern detection and potential warnings. So if I actually bring up, if, whoop, this is, uh, let me bring up, what did I want to bring up? This one. Yes, this one. Do you guys remember this from yesterday's lecture? Hopefully you do. Just making it a bit bigger. Um, this is just some random code that we used to demonstrate some of the static linting techniques yesterday. And if you remember, um, I mean, the, here's the analysis here. So PyLint is telling me, hey, Jake, you've written um, 4i in range length of scores. You should probably just enumerate it anyway. So it's telling me that what I should probably do is just 4 score in scores. You know, this is the Pythonic um, way of solving this problem. And you can see that this does not have a static and a, a PyLint warning, and this does. So this is more than just, you know, did I use indentation, indentation or spaces? This is actually an anti-pattern detection. So in your PyLint configuration, or in the default PyLint configuration, someone's decided that, hey, we should actually be warning people to not do this. Now, why does this improve the verification of our code base? Well, it stops the problem where I might have um, like an, an off by one error or something, because you can't do that in, in this, in the enumeration technique, because you don't actually use the index to look up the array, right? So there's less opportunities maybe for there to be a bug in, in when you're using enumerators rather than when you're using, um, uh, iterating with a range. And so that's still a form of static analysis. PyLint, like I said yesterday, is not executing this code. It's just looking at the characters and the tokens, and it's got some built-in knowledge about the Python syntax. Um, and then there's some other things that we can talk about, uh, coupling and cyclomatic complexity. These are a bit more theoretical, um, not really covered in this course, although it covered a little bit. Um, and we'll talk a bit about these in, I think, later in this, this exact lecture. But um, there's, there's a bunch of different things that we can look for in static analysis. And then we have um, two uh, completely not covered concepts of static verification um, or verification in general, formal verification and informal reasoning. Um, interestingly, um, so formal verification is not something that's typically taught in many undergrad programs. Um, I think the reason it's spoken about here at UNSW is that we have a very, um, strong research area in formal verification. If anyone has heard of Gernot in the school of computer science and engineering, he's a world leader in this, in this area. Um, and he has a lot of PhD students and he's got a lab on level three of the K-17 building. Um, so it's kind of cool to talk about formal verification um, in the concept of verification generally, but please keep in mind this is not um, included really in the scope of this course. So what is formal verification? It's uh, a mathematical approach to a fundamentally verifying that a software system um, contains desirable properties. So it treats software algorithms implemented in software as mathematical objects that can be reasoned about with um, formal proof notation, typically. Um, so proof assistance, model checkers, and automatic theorem provers. Um, so this is some sort of statistics about the effort that it takes to actually formally verify a software system. So to verify this microkernel, I think this link is, is down, actually. Um, but... Um, it took 20 person years, 480,000 lines of proof script and 10,000 lines to, to verify 10,000 lines of C in the microkernel. And this was done by Gannot's team. 
uh, in the past at some point. Um, so yeah, some, some interesting information there. So if you've got that really mathematical theoretical mindset, this can be a really interesting research area. So those are all forms of static and uh, static verification. Now let's go on to the dynamic verification. So this is when we actually execute the code that we're writing to verify it. So often we just call this testing. So if someone's saying that we're doing unit tests or pi test or anything like that, um, anytime we are writing code that gets executed, that's dynamic verification or testing. Testing in the small, testing in the large and acceptance testing. Now, testing is not uh, a perfect solution to software. G yes, great tests really help us um, out with um, making sure our software is stable and bug-free. But we, there is no such thing as a perfect test suite for a software system that means you'll never have a bug. Um, it does not... Um, show that, that, that there is an absence of bugs. Um, it shows that we have a bug, right? If, if our tests fail, we have a bug, but it doesn't mean that if they pass, we have no bugs. Now, why is that? Because we write, typically humans are not really great at writing tests. We write the code. We know how the code should work. We have a mental model of what we tried to do. We can sink out of the box a little bit about techniques to test it and try and make it break. But typically we won't even think about some of the problems that will go wrong. And so we will just simply never write a test that fails, right? Um, and so we're not proving that there are no bugs. We're just proving that there are some if the tests fail. So testing in the small, what are we talking about here? This is basically what we call unit tests. Um, so unit tests are the smallest um, possible atomic test you can write for a specific area of your code, um, specific software components. These can be white box or black box, and we're going to do some demonstrations shortly of unit tests, with some white box ones and some black box ones. However, please keep in mind, this is all over the spec and all over the lecture videos. Um, for this course, Comp1531, for the projects, you only need to write black box tests. We don't want you to write any white box test, tests. In fact, you should not write any white box tests or you'll lose marks potentially. So black box tests only, but I will show you how to write some white box tests. It's a lot of alliteration with these terms. In fact, why don't we jump to the unit testing demo now? Do we have any um, conceptual questions about the content that I've covered so far? And while I ask that question and the, the delay gets through, I'm gonna start reading the chat. There's a f just a couple stuff that I missed. Um, for the major projects, ver verification our tests, validation is us checking that UNSW wants a team clone and not a Discord clone. That's a great example, Hamish, 100%. It's like, should we even be building this in the first place? 100%. Um, verification goes even further and it's it's like, um, um, you know, I might write my seams project and every test passes, everything I needed to do is working, but it's too slow. That's verified, but not valid because the user might get frustrated. So it's a bit more nuanced, but 100% you're right. Um, are white box tests okay for clear V1 given its effect is implementation specific? There are some ways to still black box test it, Hamish, um, and we'll discuss those in a moment. So difference between white box and black box. I'll, show, I'll talk about that in the demo in a second. Okay, what are white box? Okay, let's just jump to the demo. All right, so let's close the lint file. We don't need that anymore. Um, let me just zoom out one more time and I want to bring up, okay, this is what I want to bring up. Now, this might be a little tricky. I might have to zoom out. Is this readable to everyone? Do you want me to zoom out one more time or is this, this okay? So. What is this code? This is actually iteration one code. <laughs> um, hopefully this is not um, new to you. This is the code that Hayden wrote in the project introduction, 
the second project interaction video, right? Do you all recognize it now? So Hayden got started with how we can write some of this code. Um, and this is what he wrote. So nothing, nothing new here. What do we have here? We have auth.py. This is an actual, um, the authentication module of the Seams project. And we have uh, auth test. Um, this is the authentication testing module that tests auth.py. So we have the, the brother and sister combo here of the implementation and then the, the testing. So, and I just want to, I know it's not sort of perfect. So I just want to make sure that everyone can read this. Okay. So these are all black box tests and these are all black box unit tests. So let's break down what makes these unit tests and what makes these black box. Well, first of all, what makes them unit tests? I said just earlier that unit tests are the smallest possible thing we can test um, at a time. So let's, here we have that we are testing um, the registration and we don't want any duplicates. So we register a user, then we register, oops, the exact same user with the exact same details, the exact same email. And what we're saying is that, hey, this should raise an error because we do not want this to be able to work. So you can see that the amount of code, I can't write any less code to test this, right? I can't break down auth register anymore without it going into white box territory. I've looked at what is available in my auth.py module and that's all I'm calling from the code. I'm not calling anything else. I'm not calling other functionality to create a user object and then input it. I'm just putting it manually in here ourselves. It's the smallest possible thing to test one very small unit. I'm testing that when I register, there are no duplicates. If I made a function called test, you know, registration and it like registered a user one, registered user two, tested, they both work, tested, you know, registered user three, tested, it didn't work. Let's say I did all of this in one test. Is this a unit test? This pauses to wait for chat to... <laughs> Have some responses. Right, so in my opinion, the answer is no. What this really is, is two or three tests in one, but that's no longer a unit test. Um, what I wanna do is register user one and test that that worked. Have a test that just does that. Then I wanna register user, so this might, whoops. What did I just do? This might be one test, you know, register and, and test. I might want a test to test that I can register two users, but that's a separate, you know, that would be a, oops, test to registrations. And then this test is like the, you know, no duplicates. So you can see there's like, there's like three tests built into one here, which means it's no longer a unit test. Um, it should be broken down into multiple things. And Nathan, that's a great comment. If something goes wrong with this test, we don't, yeah, that's true. We don't really know why we need to break it down further. Therefore, then we will actually create the unit tests. But it's also another reason that we, we do it this way. It's because we don't want side effects from other tests to potentially impact. Um, so for example, no duplicates might work just fine, um, but um, I now think it doesn't work, but it was an actually an issue because the first user didn't get registered properly, etc. Et and then it gets all, all mumbled. Um, so, but this is what I'm trying to say, okay, um, to Tejas or Tejas, sorry, Tejas, I don't know how to say your name. It doesn't mean you can't have a test that doesn't do multiple things. 
very, very often you will have tests that do multiple things, but that is its own unit test. This is a really important concept to get your head around. Please sort of listen carefully. This might be a valid test, a valid unit test, in fact, but only if the test is testing two users then dupe. That's now a unit test. Does that make sense? I can't test this any other way than registering user one, registering user two, making sure that worked, then registering user sort of, I guess that should be like user two again and making sure that didn't work. That's a unit test. But not if this was like my only test and this was how I was testing that user one got registered. Yeah, so you got it now. Good question though, good question. So, but very often, and maybe at the end of this lecture, I'll show you um, the unit tests that we've written for the project that I work on in industry. Again, it's in another language, so it's not really transferable, but the concepts are, but our tests do a lot of things sometimes, but that's because we needed to do those things to, to test one specific circumstance or state or unit. So um, that's black box unit testing. Okay, let's talk about, that looks like a duplicate test. I don't know what that's saying. Um, oh, that's because there's nothing sort of here. All right, let's just get rid of this. Let's talk about white box testing. So let's say we're testing the data store. Um, and we want to test that um, maybe that like clear works. So it may be possible to test clear with a black box test, but it might be, it's probably difficult and it's probably not the best way to do it in this very specific circumstance. So what makes these black, bo black box tests and what makes a white box test? Let's see our, our data store here. Well, the data store is like, uh, it's an object with a, a list of keys, so like names and, or, you know, users, for example. And then this has got like, you know, user one, user two, for example. Okay. Well, this is not an empty data store. So the empty data store would look something like this, right? And then there would be something else, you know, you've seen the data store and, and, and you're on top of, of, of that. So in fact, let's call out the data store to be clear, you know. This is something else that might be an object, etc. So this creates my data store. Or in fact, what we would, yeah. So this, this creates a data store object. Then I can get the data store from, um, you know, from the correct module in seams. Right, so I don't have the data store code here, so I'm not gonna import it, but you would import the data store and there's a there's the, the get method, right? There's the get method that returns to an object um, that looks something like this. Right, all with me so far? I might then Get the data, you know, get the, let's call data score empty. So this is my empty data store and this is my real data store that I get back here. I might then go data store and go to the uh, users, right? Um, and append some, you know, new user. Right? My data store is no longer empty. Now there's no method in the data store or in auth or anywhere else where I can, you know, check that the data store object is empty. So what do I need to do that I need to then get into what the data store actually is to do my test. And you can see I've already broken the black box ID here because I, I went out and I actually looked at like what is in the data store. This is what's in the data store. I need to actually type that out. So this is already a white box test. So let's say I append a user. I then, you know, uh, clear it. 
And then I want to test that it's actually clear. Well, what do I need to do? I need to compare data store empty to data store. And how to actually do that, um, I'm not going to go into because that's part of the project and or you know, your understanding of Python and things like that. But you can say I've basically got to check that users is an empty list in the data store empty and that's equivalent to the, the, the list in data store and that the keys are the same. The values are the same. Like I'm, I've got to test the individual fields. And the only way I know what field the fields should be is because I actually looked in the data store module and looked at what the fields were, right? And so that's now a white box test. If we look at these black box tests again, why are they called black box tests? Because I don't know or care um, what auth register v1 does. I'm just calling it. Right? If I went into the code base and I looked at what auth v1 did, and let's say auth v1, um, you know, adds to the data store. Let's say I added to the data store myself here and then tested auth register v1 again. This would not be a black box test. Right? Because I had to go into the data store and I, and I did what auth register v1 does. What black box tests do and why they're so important and why they're more helpful than white box tests is because when your code is running, when Seams is running in production on a server or when you're you know, running it, when you're building it, the only way an author can get registered is when auth register v1 is called. Right? There's no programmer on a production server going, well, I just need to add to the data store, blah, 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 blah. No. Auth register v1 gets invoked some data gets passed in and this is how it registers an, a, a, a user. So this is how we need to test it. And I don't care what it does internally. And that's a black box test. Does that make sense to everyone? Yes. Don't, you shouldn't write, there might be an exception, I'll clarify in the spec, um, but you, you will not write white box tests and we don't write any white box tests in our test suite. Why, why don't we write any white box tests, for example? Well, you might decide that you want your data store to look a little bit, little bit differently. And if we wrote white box tests, or if you wrote white box tests, then you, the test would fail. Because I don't know what your data store should look like. I just want to test all the things that you've published your interface into manipulating um, your data store. So, cause one of the things we do guys is that if you look back at the leaderboard, did I get rid of the tab? I did. Um, can someone, can someone please repost the leaderboard and I'll explain it. Um, I've lost the link. Um, and now I've lost my train of thought. Yeah. Oh, that's right. The tests that you write for, um, your project, we will actually run those tests on other code base. Um, so they need to be white box tests. Otherwise all the tests would sort of fail. Actually, I don't know if we do run it on the other projects, but we run it on yourself and we run ours on yours. So yeah. Um, it's yeah, it, it exactly. Kanan black box testing is an abstraction layer over the functionality and we only call the interfaces into the functions. Um, so let me go. Oh, you can't post links. Damn. It's okay. Don't worry. All right. Let me go through the chat a little bit. So is looking at what the function returns, not a black box test. Oh, that's a great question. Uh, great point. Falconer. Um, Great, great, great point. So let's look at, uh, in this example, right, we've got auth login v1, right? And it returns an object with a key and a value. Let me just go over here. Test auth login v1. I call auth login v1. 
whoops, I get the results. Now, the question basically is, can I test that result, you know, can I assert that result uh, dot or auth user ID is equal to one? Yes, that's, that's not a white box test. Because I, I need to test that I'm getting back what I expect. But why can I, why is this okay? Because if we go to the spec, um, let's see here, uh, content, I think, uh, no, not content, stuff, uh, repo, oh no, yes, repos, project backend. If we go to the spec, let's look at auth login. If I can type, if I look at the spec here, the spec specifies that auth login v1 should return a, 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 an object with auth user ID. So I can test that that is true. That is fine. I need to test that, that is true. And I need to test that it's the right ID that I expect. But this is not um, white box because it's in the specification that this should be here. Right? So we can look at what a function returns. We can't look at what a function does internally. Oops. Um, what about the messages a function? What about the messages function? Oh, there is no create message in spec one. Um, yeah, so in this case, I think that that's why I'm sort of adding a caveat. I think in iteration one, I got to confirm, but I think some white box tests are okay. Um, oops, it's not listed here um, for the messages and for, for stuff like that in particular. But let me confirm and I'll, and I'll put like an announcement out or something and I'll get Emily to talk about that as well at some point. Um, in some communication, but there might be times only in iteration one as not all the functions are complete where you might be allowed to do a little bit, but only in certain circumstances. So, but it, it, you can talk to your tutor about stuff like that. And it's not, um, it's not going to stop you make any progress or anything like that. Um, okay. Uh, ooh, ooh, there's a lot of questions here and it's to scroll my chat. Um, yeah, so Hamish, I think, yeah, I think that might be right. You can have a white box test and then replace it later with a black box test. But let me, let me confirm um, what we want to see with this. Um, yes, it's kind of like abstraction. Um, so someone says, to clarify, oh, <laughs> Wacken says, we can, can we use multiple functions if they're reliant on each other, but we can't access the data store directly because it assumes a method of oper operation? Absolutely. So this is what I was talking about with, one of the examples, I think I might've deleted it. Yeah. With one of the examples, sometimes you have to do multiple things to make a unit test. That's absolutely fine. And that means you can, you can use multiple functions. Absolutely. Like for example, to post a message, if you had a test to post a message first, you would need to create a user and then you would need to post the message. Right? So you need to do a few things. That's completely fine. Um, Stephen asked, Jake, may I clarify, is the auth user ID an integer or a string? The spec is a little confusing with that. Auth user, oops, ID. Um, it's, so when a data type is specified in, we haven't spoken about JSON yet, but this is basically a JSON format. When any, anything in here, right, in the API, so like what this specification is, it's always a string. All um, data transmitted over the internet, which is eventually, oh no, these, these are the methods actually, these are the internal methods, because this is iteration one, sorry. Um, yeah, good point. It might be up to you actually how you implement that. It could be either, I think, because Oh no, no, because we must call, we must call it. Let me, let me double check 
I'm going to write a little note here. So let me, to, I'll write a note to get Emily to update the spec. So auth user ID, is it an integer or string? It might be specified somewhere else in the spec and I can't quite remember, um, but. Oh, there you go. It might be this. Yeah, there you go. It's right here. So if it's a, if it ends in ID, it's an integer. It's right here, Stephen. Okay. So Muhammad asks, how would you know that auth user ID starts at one? Well, I don't quite, you could, auth, you could call auth user, you know, you could authenticate a user. So register a user and then check the ID and check that it is one. Like I said, you can test the return types. So you can test auth user ID. Um, so are we allowed to test that our functions store stuff correctly in our customized data store? Absolutely. But the way that you would do that is get the data store, you know, so call data store dot get and then test the values that got returned. That's completely fine, but you can't start, you can't, whoops, you can't go in and then start like manipulating things in terms of the code. You can only manipulate things through the functions that are written. Is it okay to have a separate testing file to ensure that we're storing the right thing in the data store? Absolutely. You can create any testing files in any structure at any placement that you want that go above or beyond what we ask you to test. Um, this question might be really specific to the project, but for example, channels create v1 states that the user who creates the channel joins it. Yep. We wouldn't be able to test this in this case. Well, it depends if we have the functionality to get the users of a channel yet. We might not be able to yet, and so we won't have a test for it in iteration one. Yep, so Hamish has clarified that. Um, I think Stephen's answered, question is answered. What is a general median mark for the project just so we can get a rough indication of the expectation of the... Oh, I mean, I guess you mean expectations of Monday. I don't remember the median iteration one mark, but something important on that iteration one is marked the least is weighted the least. I don't know if it's in the spec. Yeah, yes, it's here. Iteration one is only worth 25% of the project mark. So 25% of the, and the project mark, I think is 35%. So it's only 25% of 35%. Typically iteration one gets the lowest um, average marks because everyone's, some people enrolled late, groups are still settling, people are getting up to speed. And that's why we've made it worth so little. Really, this is only, I think it comes down to less than 12% of your overall course grade, just iteration one. Right. So, um, yeah. Okay. Wait, so auth login is meant to return author user ID or one or just one. No, it returns the key value pair. It returns auth user ID and one in a dictionary. It's not saying that the spec is not saying that it only, where is that table? The specification is not saying that it only returns an integer. It's just saying that when something is an integer, the value is this type. So this is, this is correct. It returns an object with the key auth user ID and the value, which is an integer. Um, so I hope that answers, answers your question there. Um, how can I search if something exists within the dictionary that is a return from a function using assert? How can I test? How can I search if something exists within a dictionary? I mean, there's a, you could iterate over the returned dictionary and just test the value using a, a, a loop, right? Um, scrambling to learn Python, yep. Yeah. How about handle generated from auth user v1.
Do you mean, I don't, do you mean off register? V1, which one are you talking about here? Sorry. Um, do we get to argue, so to speak, for marks due to assumptions in the markdown? Or, oh, due to assumptions, or is the markdown only considered? Um, it will really help you if you've pre-put your assumption in the markdown file, because you want to show that you thought about it and not that you're just arguing after the fact. But like I've always said, we're on your case, uh, we're on your side, right? So um, we're not going to just penalize you um, because you, you made some small decision that had a big impact. Another thing with the auto marking that it's worth talking about, and then we've got to move on. If you make an error in your project, let's say you make this return a string, right? Let, let's just say, which is incorrect. It should return an integer, but let's just say you made a return a string. And that one mistake made every test fail. Let's say this happens. You will not get a zero, <laughs> okay? We will look at it. You will tell us, you'll be all sad. Then we'll be sad for you. And then we will make you fail the equivalent of one test. Does that make sense? So if you make one mistake or one, even one sweep of mistakes, like let's say you make all the IDs return a string, um, like here is, you know, here as well. Um, that's still, we're not going to uh, sort of stack the penalty. It'll just be a one-off penalty. Does that make sense? Um, but you've got it. That's a, that's a, that obviously has to be manually intervened with. So you've got to tell your tutor if that happens. It happened to me many times when I tutored last term. Um, well, just once actually, <laughs> not many times, but we just fixed it up. It's no problem. Um, we use the default pilot config. Yep, I'm pretty sure. And if we don't, we'll give you the pilot config, but I think we do. So there's lots of questions about um, how do we do the test if um, the functions don't exist yet. There's sort of two answers to it. One is that we just might not be able to black box test it yet. Um, and we can add, we will add the black box tests more thoroughly in iteration two. And once again, that's reflected in why the iteration one waiting is, is so low. Um, I will clarify with um, the project team on if you are able to write some white box tests in iteration one, I think it might be possible. Um, but let me, I just want to, I don't want to say anything that's wildly incorrect because I got to look at how the infrastructure for our testing works and all things like that. So I'm just being a little bit hesitant to, to say solidly, but if you, you know, post, post, if someone posts it on the forum, I think it's already been discussed on the forum, but if one of you, just one of you, so we don't get 20 posts about it. Let me see, who am I going to pick to do this? Um, or who's the last person? Victor, Victor Lee. If you go to the forum and you write a post, you know, tag it with the project and ask this question, um, we'll get a, the, the actual correct response. Cool. Alrighty. That is, I believe, everything I wanted to talk about with 3.4. Okay, there's, there's a couple little things. Um, so this is all what we're calling testing in the small. This is not a formal term. This is just our own sort of separation, testing the small, right? We're testing very small units, atomic tests. Testing in the large is when we start doing larger integration tests. There's many, many different ways that we can do these integration tests, but integration tests are definitely almost always black box. But you can think of it, imagine that you were able, now you can't do this yet. You might, I don't think, we, we don't do this at all in this course, but imagine, you finish your seams project, you, you've got a front end that's working, it's all looking good. A integration test or a, lar a testing in the large could be, you, it is possible actually to automate testing frameworks to like load up a website, find the search field, type in a request, hit enter and verify that the thing that comes back is what we expected it to come back. So it's not actually running any code. It is running the system, but it doesn't know what the code is doing at all. And that you can imagine is a testing in the large sort of framework. Now we don't do that in this course and we don't test it in this course. Um, so module tests, integration tests and system tests, testing the entire system at once. 
Um, is there a front-end course in CEC? There sure is. It's Comp 6080 and it's taught by Hayden at the moment. I really want to teach it one day. I got some cool ideas for a front-end course. Anyway, um, then we have acceptance testing. So what is acceptance testing? Acceptance testing is basically a complete, okay, now it's like we're completely paradigm shift here. This is basically when I literally sit down a student, oh, sorry, not a student, a user of my system. And I say, hey, can you um, create an account on, um, um, on this website that you've maybe you've never used it before. And they will literally pick up a mouse start clicking, get lost, go in the wrong menu, come back, click the right thing. And then you might say, Hey, um, how was that? Did you, did that, is this system working for you? Is it, does it have the features of the system that you like? Um, that's acceptance testing. It's like, okay, I don't really care whether your system does what it, you know, the tests pass, the tests fail, whatever. If you sit the user in front of the system and ask the, you know, the customer, to determine whether or not what you built is what they wanted. That's acceptance testing. This is where a lot of projects actually fail um, because you built something, you, you solved Y, but the problem was X. This is, remember, we're going back to that X, Y problem I spoke about at the start. This happens all the time. The amount of projects that have been created and written that were never used because they solved the wrong problem. I can't imagine the amount of man hours or person hours that went into that. Um, it's yeah, it's, it's scary to think about. That's because people solved why when they were meant to be solving something else. Um, and acceptance testing is how we can actually formally test this. Acceptance testing typically occurs in the old sort of style of waterfall models. You would have a formal acceptance testing phase after the project was completed and the tests were passing and all of that. With more agile approaches, you, you're kind of always doing acceptance testing because you're always pushing updates to your product out and sitting people in front of it and getting their feedback. Um, yeah, so that's acceptance testing. And we don't do any of that in this course. So you need to know about it. You need to understand how it's working and stuff. Um, but you don't actually need to, you know, we're not going to make you sit users down and make them use your Seams product and then do acceptance testing. So um, um, you don't have to actually worry about doing it. Okay. And that is the 3.4 lecture. As always, I've got the Google, the Microsoft form at the top. I know there were a bunch of questions about the white box, black box. How do we test something when the function is not written? Um, Victor's going to write that uh, question post on the forum um, and we'll get that sorted out there. Um, I just don't want to give misleading advice on when everyone's going to watch this lecture. Okay. Um, let me just like check chat really quickly. Is there a front end course? Yep. What is dry run? Um, we, t we do, I think we cover dry run stuff um, in this course. Let me get a, yeah. So basically a, a, a dry run test is when you um, intentionally test what happens if something went wrong in your system. So like, I think in a way, I'm not sure if this is 100% Correct, but in a way, I think um, technically, yeah, these are dry run tests um, because you're testing something that should raise an error. I, I think that that is correct, um, but we have a we have a some lecture content on dry runs coming up at some point. We or we might be calling. I don't. You might have been asking in a different context, actually. Okay, do we wanna take a five minute break? Um, and then we will jump to 3.5, I think. Cool. Okay. Oops.
Okay, and we're back. <clears throat> Excuse me. I just shoved some hummus uh, and some crackers down my throat, so my mouth is all, all dry. Um, okay. Um, just noticed an, a question I missed from before the break. Um, is 1531 dry, one, dry run one supposed to be three out of four past? No, it should be four out of four passed. Um, so there's obviously some functionality that you've missed that's causing one of the dry runs to fail. And the dry runs are just, there's basically four in iteration one only. There's four dry run tests that basically test um, that something that shouldn't work or should go wrong does actually do the right thing. So there's just a form of tests. Um, What's the difference between auth user ID and the user ID? The user ID is the, the ID of the user <coughs> that you store in the data store. So like Jake is always user four. Um, but when I have an authentication token or a session, this gets built upon in the later iterations. Um, the auth user ID is, is my specific authentication ID. So there is a difference. Um, um, Sienna, did everyone see my email that went out last night? So all of the tutorials today, I should have said this earlier. Oh, but yeah, there were already tutorials this morning. All the tutorials today are online and we're going to sort of play it day by day with the weather for the tutorials for the rest of the, um, for the rest of the week. That's what most of the courses in the school are doing. So yeah, hopefully everyone's safe. And if you're from the areas that are getting more affected, um, I hope, I hope everyone's doing okay with that. Um, we've got a lot of project related questions. Here's what I propose is that we, so this lecture won't take um, 45 minutes. It'll take about 30 minutes. And then at the end, we've got a 15 minute period where we can just chat about the project and chat sort of more generally. Does that sound good to everyone? All right. So, um, and all this is stuff is gonna help you with the project anyway. So code coverage. So this is something that we do um, for the project marking as well. So what is code coverage? So I, I mentioned earlier that if we write um, if we write unit tests, it doesn't mean our code is going to be perfect and bug free, right? We can write bad unit tests that pass, or we can only test certain things and not test other things and now our system is still buggy and problematic anyway. So coverage is an automatic, another form of static verification that actually tests if our, um, it evaluates if our tests actually cover all of the different sections of our code. So it introduces a few new tools 
um, the concept of coverage, the concept of code coverage, and the tool pie coverage. So how do we know that we've got a good breadth of our tests? Um, well, we have test and code coverage. So test coverages, a measure of how much of the feature set is covered um, with our tests, um, often left to human judgment. And code coverage, um, a quantitated, a computed evaluation of how much of our code is being executed during our tests. Now, these aren't perfect approaches. And I'll, when I get into the demo, it'll be clear why that is. But they do help. And um, you want to aim for 100% coverage. So basically, coverage is measured in a percentage. So what percent of the lines of our code is uh, tested. I mean, it can give us a pretty good indication of, of how uh, broad and how in-depth our testing is. And it highlights what's not being tested. That's the most valuable part. It's similar to the unit tests and pie tests where just because you have 100% coverage doesn't mean you're perfectly testing everything to the nth degree. It just means you haven't forgotten certain sections of the code. So let's actually jump into a demo. Let me close this. I'm not going to save that. Close that. All right. So I've got a file here, I'll make it a bit bigger, called, uh, it's just got a function called, um, with a, a called is leap year, and it's just got some logic that can determine, um, I'm sure it's not perfect, but basically if a year is divisible by four, um, or is not divisible by four, it's not a leap year. If it, um, you know, it's got some, some cases for when a year is a leap year or not a leap year. So we can basically call this is leap year. We can give it a year. So like 2022, we can print that out. We can run this, <clears throat> losing my voice a little bit. And you can say that this year, 2022 is not a leap year. Okay. So that's all, that's all good and dandy. So then we write some tests. Um, and let me know if you guys prefer um, the files side by side like earlier or switching between them. So we can write some tests, right? So we've got, you know, two test subs here that I just wrote. And let's just say, let's just write a test that tests if, you know, is, actually, why don't we do this? Is 2022 a leap year? Okay, so this is a pretty bad test, um, but... Let's not worry about it too much. So um, I call is leap year and I give it 2022 and I assert um, that this is false. And we've asked for side by side, so let's do that. Okay, let's just for the sake of making this nice and simple, get rid of that. And we're importing is leap year from, is, uh, from the is leap year module. They're in the same directory. So if I run PyTest here on, yep, just run it here. Oops, oh, because um, I've got a bunch of other random files in here. So let me just go, um, I think I just go test leap year. Yeah, so if I just, you know, pi test this, this testing file here, um, we can see that all our tests pass. And we've only got one test, one um, test function, and it's just testing that is 22, 2022 a leap year. So is this, oops, is this a valid test? Sure, this is testing that I know 2022 shouldn't be a leap year, so I'm, I'm testing that. But does this mean that because I've got 100% of my tests to pass, does this mean that I've fully tested this function very well? What's the coverage of this function? Whoops. 
No, I, I mean, I haven't tested 2020. I haven't, there's four, this is, that's exactly right, Ricardo. There's four cases here. I've not tested that they're all working correctly. I've only tested maybe one or two of them. So, and we've spoken about, with our static ver verification techniques, we want to automate as much of this sanity testing as much as possible. Because at, once again, this always goes back to what, what is software engineering? Software engineering, Comp 1531, is all about the tools, techniques, and concepts we use to solve to improve code quality at scale. So again, if this is a massive project, can I ask Ricardo or Paul or Hamish or anyone in the chat to go through a massive repository and check, you know, manually check, am I test? Like, it's possible. I, I know I'm not testing all of this code, but it's not quantifiable. I haven't, I'd have to pay someone to sift through every line of code and determine, is there a test written? We don't want to do that. We can't do that. It doesn't scale. What do we do? We're software engineers. We write programs. We write tools to test these things for us. And um, the tool that we're going to be looking at today that does this form of testing for us is called coverage. Now, if you install the, the requirements.txt um, file for the Python um, module in this course, you'll already have coverage installed. Um, but basically, it's just a, 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 pip, a Python module called coverage. Um, and how it works, if we go over back to the lecture slides, we can run um, coverage run, give it a source file, and give it the PyTest module. Because there could be other testing modules that people want to use with coverage. But we want to show that we're using PyTest. So um, now the only thing is... Actually, this should be okay. This should be okay. So, yeah, okay, never mind. Let me just delete. Or actually, what I might just do is, yep, sorry about this. Leap, yeah.py. Um, I'm just going to move the files out so that they're on their own. Give me a second. Um, I want this one. Oops. And I want, okay, let's get rid of that. All right. Oh no, I copied the wrong one. Damn. Okay. Yeah, I think I could change the source, but I just want to keep it simple. Um, uh, yeah, I just want to keep it keep it simple, because typically you wouldn't have all these unrelated files. You would just run it like this. Okay. Um, so again, if we just run pytest here now, we can see it all passes. That's fine. Let's clear that. Let's run this. So coverage run um, the current directory. That's typically how we would run it. We're using the pytest module. So this will actually um, run pytest behind the scenes. So you can see that the, the tests pass, but as well as running PyTest, it actually runs the coverage tool. And you can see it didn't actually tell us anything. There's nothing, nothing's here, right? So we actually need to tell coverage that we want to see the report. So we can use the command coverage report. And this actually tells us, look at this. We only covered 44% <clears throat> of the is leap year function. Or actually not the function, sorry, the, the module. We only covered 44% of the module. In fact, I think if I remove this line, actually no, it might not change it. Oh yeah, there you go. We've covered even less of it now because um, there's less code being executed um, on in Islipia is because basically this thought this was another call to Islipia. Now, something else to keep in mind that the coverage of the test files is always 100%. So don't give yourself a pat on the back for that. <laughs> Basically, it's saying like, you, you don't need to write tests for your test file, and then you'd have to write a test for that test file, blah, blah, blah. Okay, we don't do that. So 38% of is leap year is covered. This is a low coverage score. And it's telling us that, hey, your test suite is not very um, robust. How did it calculate 
this score. So keep in mind that when I, when I ran coverage, whoops, where's it gone? When I ran coverage, it ran PyTest. So it ran this test file. It came to this test function. It made this test assertion. It actually ran it. It jumped to is leap year 2022. It went into the branches and basically let's say, so 2022 is not divided by four. So is it divided by, it's not divisible by four, is it? Yeah, I'm just checking. I'm trying to say just which branch it ran. So it's not divisible, it's not divisible equally by four um, or Interesting. Oh, it's not equal to zero. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So. Basically, I'm just copying something. Give me a second. Uh, 2022 divide four is equal to 505.5. So it came to the pie test. It ran is leap year. It passed in 2022. This is the first line that runs in the function, right? It determined that uh, 2022 modulo four is not equal to zero because it's 505.5, okay? So it returned false. So how many lines of this function ran before it returned? Basically, it's something like either these two or maybe it counts that you called the function at all. So maybe these three. So three out of, let's say 10, um, which is 30%. It's got 38, I don't know exactly what it's doing under the hood. Maybe it waits that you called the function a bit more. Maybe it's, it's, maybe it's waiting a little bit that you called the module, then the function. So that's like four things, right? Something like that. I don't, it's, it's, it's roughly accurate. I don't know exactly how it calculates the 38, but basically, we didn't run line five, line six, line seven, line eight, line nine, or line 10. Any of these uh, lines could be faulty and we never called pie test on them. So our coverage score is reflecting that. So now I could run another test, which is def test a leap year. Now someone in the chat's gonna need to tell me what's the next leap year. Let's, it is 2024, okay. only two years away. Ooh. In fact, we can just do that, right? Um, now, this is going to have to run more lines of code because this is not going to uh, evaluate to true, right? So if I run this command again, and then I view the coverage report, you can see my coverage score jumped up because now more lines of code were written. Um, so then if we find a year that's divisible by 400, I mean, we could even just do, you know, test a 400 year. Um, and I run this. You can see that our score goes even uh, even higher. And then finally, we could do something like, yeah, we can test uh, a millennium. Is that how you spell millennium? I don't even. And we could probably also do a test for like a negative year, something, something weird. Oops. Okay, so you can see, oh, okay, hold on. Um, this should be equal to false. I just want to get them passing. There we go. And we view the report and, okay, it's to total 95%, still 88%. We're missing one case. Um, maybe it's this else. Maybe I need to find a year where that's coming up. But you can imagine that if you then tested, if you went through and you make sure that you test absolutely every case, um, 
you would get your 100% coverage here. If someone can think of the case that I'm missing, that would be cool. So let me check questions. Um, yep, everyone's saying no, that's awesome. Um, can we increase coverage by using unit tests? Absolutely, that's what I'm doing here, right? I'm, I'm writing unit tests. Um, okay, everyone's saying, let's, let's do it. So, well, we've got 2,000, so 300, I was saying? And that should not be a unit test, right? There we go, awesome, awesome, thank you. Um, and we get our 100% coverage. Yeah, divisible by 100, but not by 400. Okay, gotcha. Um, and negative two, yeah, it would have been. Yeah, that was a problem. Um, and we get 100% coverage. And yes, our test suite now is a lot better. It's covering more statements. So the idea behind coverage is to avoid the situation where, you know, your boss tells you, um, or you tell your future employee, you know, you're going to be amazing software engineers. Hey, we want, um, this is a really critical function. We want lots and lots of tests for it. And then you write a hundred tests that test this case only. You know, you got a hundred tests passing, the office is cheering, confetti guns are going off, um, and then the system breaks because no one ever tested that this was returning the wrong thing, right? Um, and this is what coverage helps us to, to avoid. Now, Ricardo asked a question, isn't coverage useless though? Our logic assumes that the function is wrong and the tests are right. What if the function needed to be smaller i.e. return less cases, but the user who wrote it, wrote it wrong. I mean, absolutely. This is the, this is the big asterisk and caveat with all of this unit testing and um, things like coverage. They are not indicators of quality code. They are not indicators of bug-free code. They are not indicators of perfect test, but they are indicators that we're, we're in the right direction. Um, they, coverage is not useless. It really does help me realize I did not test certain aspects of this function. Once again, it does not tell me that I tested everything in the function perfectly. Okay. So I don't, yeah, I don't agree that they're useless. But having the function smaller with less lines and less, less cases is already going to make it easier and improve your coverage scores maybe because there's less, there's less things to cover. So reducing your coverage, like reducing the amount of lines of code is always going to improve your cover score. Um, and then the last thing we can do, which is really cool, is actually view um, Uh, we can view, let's see here, the coverage scores in a nice little GUI here. So you can imagine that you could like make a break, uh, like a sort of um, a dashboard um, and you can even click into it and you can, you can actually see, um, you know, at this point where the coverage was ran, um, I didn't test this case and I didn't test this case, for example. This is a really nice sort of visual representation um, of the code that got ran um, and what I was testing and what I was not testing. Cool. Uh, what doesn't work? Huh? Okay, this is our Leapy's example. We just went over that. Um, there's another example. Okay, something else to talk about with, um, with coverage, another way we can run it. And I think this is actually the way we run it um, for the iteration uh, project auto marking. So basically you can give um, coverage this option called branch. So if we come back to the, the example here, when we run coverage, we can go I think we just do dash dash branch. Yep. And when I run the report here, we can see we have a new column here um, called branch. And what this is saying is that 
there are six branches in the file and we're testing all 100% of them. The reason why this is useful is because um, some lines can potentially jump around to more than one other line. Um, and so we need to check somehow that we're testing all the potential branches and maybe we're not actually needing to test that every single line of, of code is executed. And so that's what branches, the branch option does. And sometimes this is referred to as edge coverage. So if we have a look at some of these diagrams here, um, you can imagine that there might be functions in which, you know, it's not really possible for every line of code to be tested. What we really want to test is that certain branch paths and all that our branch branches are executed um, in our tests. And so that's what the, the branch uh, option does with coverage. So this is what we use um, when we mark your um, uh, project iteration, I believe. And the six, I'm just trying to think where the six, uh, <laughs> where the six branches are. So I think it's, it's like um, one branch is nothing happens at all. One branch is like the first one. This is the third branch. This is the fourth branch. This is the fifth branch. And then I think there's just like one, I think with branch coverage, there's some theory into it. There's like always one more. Um, for the module entirely, I think, is how it's getting to the six. But I'm not 100% sure on that. So yeah, code coverage is really useful, um, but it's more important to look at the things that we're missing rather than to hyperfixate and pat ourselves on the back when we get 100%. Just because I have 100% doesn't mean everything's written perfectly. We might still be missing important things. Um, branch coverage is more accurate measurement, so you should always use it. This is what we use in the project auto marking. Um, and like all measurements, so this is the same with pie test, with linting, with coverage. These tools are helpful. They are pointers to the right direction. They are pointers to a North Star. But it's really important you understand what they do, what they test, because they're not perfect. And it's very easy to... Um, it's very easy to make ourselves feel a false sense of security when we have 100% passing tests and 100% coverage when we're actually, we've actually got full bugs. Um, we're full of bugs in our, in our projects. So understand what they do, understand what they cover, understand what they don't cover, and you'll be one step closer to being a fantastic software engineer. Um, so yeah, you can absolutely run coverage on your project codes, ECOIC. Um, in fact, we highly recommend it. So run it with the branch command. And you can run it on everything or you can give it specific test files, etc. Awesome. That is the lecture content. I think the next one is just the feedback. You got the form in the thing. That QR code is, is outdated. Please don't use it. Use the um, forms link I've just provided you. Um, Okay, that's the lecture content for this week. Like I said, we've got 20 minutes of time to hang out. Um, last year, what Hayden did, last term, last year, what Hayden did in this time was actually talk about um, his experiences as a software engineer um, in his various projects that he's worked on and, you know, tried to relate some of the things to the course content, the content that we've spoken about, um, and the course more generally or software engineering more generally. Um, so we can do some of that. We can talk about the project. We can hang out. Um, we've got maybe 15 minutes um, to do that. So someone's just asked for the, the coverage command. It's in the lecture slides. It's in the lecture slide notes and I've just posted it as a comment as well. Um, the source is which, you know, when you run, when you run PyTest, you can give it a specific test file. That's what the source is saying. Which test file do you want to be testing with coverage? Um, I'm happy. Oh, well, that's what I was, one thing I was going to do is show you all the unit tests in the project that I work on. So you can just start seeing what sort of larger scale unit tests looks like. We can do that as a starting off point, um, Zach. And then, yeah, just throw, throw your questions basically. Um, alrighty. Where am I going? GitHub. I'm going to the back end. Uh, okay. This is really zoomed in. Oh, in fact, what am I doing? I should just... Bring it up in the editor.
Okay. Ooh, stop complaining. There you go, I was working on it. <laughs> I was working on a bug like two nights ago, last night on the back end. I'm still stuck on it. Anyway. Um, oops. So basically in, uh, once again, this is the formative system. So anytime you've used formative, this is, this is the, the code base for that project. Um, so this is the system that I help maintain. And this is the Ruby backend um, or the Ruby server for the project. And we have a bunch of tests. Um, so we have a test directory um, and a bunch of different tests that fall into um, our testing framework. So we have tests for the API specifically. That's something that you'll actually all be doing as well in a later iteration. And then we have just, you know, standard um, tests for like sort of the, the code um, basically. So let's look at the API test. So we actually, in, our, in this project for better or for worse, um, we focus on black box unit tests around the API. So basically what we test is that if I give data to the API, does it do the right thing and does it return the right thing? Um, so you can see here, th this is one test file that tests the user's functionality of, um, of this project. And I just want to clarify, I'm not, this is not a gold standard by any means for <laughs> um, good testing. I'm sure our coverage score is not very, is not that high and, um, all our tests pass, of course, there's nothing broken, but um, this is an open source project. Not, it's not a big project, it's not a big team. So our tests aren't perfect, but if they're real tests. This is, you know, this application really does use them. So we, we're using um, a different test framework that comes with, with Ruby. And um, these are all API unit tests. So for example, here's a test that um, gets all the users back from the API and tests that they're all coming back correctly. And we do a bunch of a little bit more advanced stuff here that we actually do introduce you to in this concept, in this course later on. Um, but for example, okay, if I need to get all the users from an API, I need to be authenticated. So I have some, we have some helper functions that um, make sure that we actually are authenticated. And then we make a get request and we're getting the request at this API. Okay, what is in that expected data? Well, here, what we actually do is we are going straight to the database and getting all the users and then comparing that A, the API request worked, the number of users is correct, right? So we're testing the count and that the response had the correct things in what came back. And then we actually go through and we check each user to make sure they came back correctly. And this is, so this goes back to what we we're talking about where can you have a unit test that has multiple things in it? Absolutely. Um, this has multiple assertions, right? Um, but it's testing one concept, which is that we're getting all the users back and all the data's there and all the keys are there. And this is one, one unit test. And you can see the syntax is pretty similar to Python. Like you just go assert equal. So that asserts that two objects are the same or whatever, uh, two values are the same. You know, you write a loop to do something and you do your assertion in the loop. You know, it's pretty sort of straightforward and, and similar to what we've been talking about with PyTest. Um, and sort of, I guess, in how PyTests help us. So very recently, um, we did a major upgrade to the back end. So we upgraded the version of Rails that it's using. And it was a big change. I mean, if I show you the... Um, if I show you the pull request for, for it, which is a merge request um, in GitLab. Um, I think if I go rail six, let's see here. Uh, maybe. Um, okay, was it this one? Yeah. Okay, cool. So we, we recently ran this upgrade and then, so this branch that got pulled in had a changes over 131 files in the project. So we are upgrading, we're doing a major upgrade of rails and, and that meant right. So rails is the uh, a Ruby 
framework for running uh, an API. So this one upgrade <laughs> required um, all, I mean, you can just see how many changes there were. Basically, you know, the, lang the language and the framework changed. So we had to update all of the code that interacted with it. And, and sometimes that meant other libraries that we were using were no longer compatible. So we had to replace them. That made more changes. And so you can just see it was a huge, huge um, change. So when you're making such a large change to a project, it's really scary because so many things could break in ways that you wouldn't expect. But what helps us with that, that worry and that anxiety is all of our unit tests. We already had all of these unit tests that were already working, that had been built up over years. And so we make this major change and then we run the unit tests and if the test started failing, that's what happened. A lot of tests started failing. Um, and then you can go through and fix all your, your, your change code up until your tests pass. And then you feel it's not 100%. There were still bugs that got through. And when those bugs got through, we fixed the bug and we added the correct unit test associated with it. Um, and so that's, that's where tests really um, help, help you out. Okay, um, are there any files that have no PyTests tests in the project? No, I don't think so. No files, no, nope. everything gets tested. Everything major gets tested at least. I mean, there might be something small here or there. But all the, all the actual functions that you write get tested. Um, do we need to test our data storage methods? So if we create extra methods to get and send certain properties, do we need to test it? So that would be a white test, white box test. Because um, the functions, so first of all, it's great that you wanted to write functions um, to help you do stuff. That's what we do as programmers. Repeated things, we, we wrap up as a function, we call it once, our lives are good. But that's still an internal function that only you and your team will have. And so um, we don't care how it works. What we care about is that if we, um, if we, I've lost. What we care about is that if we call auth register v1, I don't really care if you call, you know, some helper function. I don't care if, if you've written that function. I don't care if it, what it does. And we don't even really care if you test it. What we care about is that auth register v1 does what it should do, returns the correct thing, and we can, you know, validate that without, with the auth test. So testing this particular helper function would still be a white test test. Now, here's the sort of nuance to that. Are we testing that helper function? Yes, we're still testing it because we called auth register v1 that called the helper function, but we don't have a test to, to call that particular function and check that it worked. Does that answer your question? The other thing is that it wouldn't be possible for us to test it because we don't know what the function's called and what it should do. We only know what we know from the spec. You know, we, we can't test anything that's not in here because we don't know what your method would be called. We don't know what parameters it accepts. Um, does the leaderboard always refresh after we merge to master? No, the leaderboard refreshes, I think, once a day in the morning. So you might push new code to master and it's not going to be live updated. Um, so you do need to keep that in mind, right? So just to clarify, do you mean calling the data store is a white box test? What do you mean by calling the data store? The data store is an object, right? With data in it. Oh, there's the dry run information here. Um, but I, so I think what, I mean, you might clarify what you meant, but 
like if you look at look at this line here um, if you wish you are allowed to modify the data store so we do not have there will not be a test that we write that goes and gets all the data in your data store and checks it that's a white box test how you implement and modify um, the data store is up to you um, what we test is that like if I call get channels that I get back this list if I call get users for example I get back this list and it has to be exactly what we want but how you actually implement how the overall data store is stored that's up to you that would be a white box test and we don't run that test because we don't know you might change the format of this we, we don't know and then you might map it back so that it returns something like this yeah we don't test the helper functions in your data store for example unless one of the black box tests that we call calls your function then it by proxy gets tested but we're not specifically calling it so if i call a function in auth login do i need to create another test file to test it yes and no like you could do it to you know help you make sure you wrote good code but we only do black box tests on the specifications here so we only have black box tests for like auth login v1 auth register v1 you know these we don't know if you create a helper function what it's called um so um we only test what we know which is what's in the spec so we're not going to you know call a helper function that you write but you could write that test yourself just to make yourself you know feel comfortable so ricardo okay ricardo's got a great this is a fantastic example Ricardo, you've, you've um, done a better job than, than I've done of explaining it. Uh, let me get an uh, auth test here. So, if I had a, a call like this, this is, oops, this is a white box test because I'm, I need to know that in the data store there's the user's key that's got some ID like I need to know the structure of the data store we don't do any tests like this this is a white box test what we do is something like assert that you know the data store dot get no we would no 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 sorry what we test is that like users dot get user ID is equal to user id1 now use it now you don't you might not have a you know this could be like a get all users v1 something like this right right so you might have some function that gets all the users that we tell you needs to be in your spec this may or may not be in the spec it might come into a spec in iteration two whatever this is a black box test under the hood what get all users might it might do this just this part right it might do this but we don't care that's up to you to implement we just want to test that does it get back the right thing basically think of it like this here's a here's an analogy ricardo let's say i ask you to um what's an example here <laughs> I ask you to um, go buy me a big pen, okay? Like, let's say, I don't know, we're working together and I say, like, I really need a pen, Ricardo, go get me a pen. I don't care how you do it, I don't care what shop you go to, I don't care if you walk there, I don't care if you drive there, just please get me a pen. You come back an hour later and you give me a pen, I'm happy. I don't ask where you went, I don't even ask how much it costs. <laughs> Um, although that's probably important. I don't ask how you got there. I don't care who you spoke to. I don't care if you went to an aisle or if you went to the desk. That I just all I care is that I asked you to get the pen and you got me a pen. That's a black box test. That's testing the specified specified function that we provide. If I then said, "How did you get there? Did you take uh, the company car or your own car? Did you use credit card or cash?" Like that's now getting into like the white box testing methods. Because you, it's up to your teams to decide how you do things. 
And because we want you to have that functionality, we can't test it because we don't know what you did. So we test the, the contract um, specifically. Will we lose marks if we keep white box tests in our code? I don't know. I don't think you do. No. Nope. All we run on the leaderboard, I've lost it. I gotta get the. Bear with me one second. Oop. All we run on the leaderboard are your group tests. So these are the tests that you write. Um, our tests that we write and we multiply them together. So there's no other, you know, there's nothing else going into it. There's no minus marks for this or blah, 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 blah. So we can use a function to create our data within the test, or would that be considered a white box test? Yeah, that would actually, but yeah, that would be considered, you can't call, you can't call like your helper function here. Because then this test is not, you know, a black box test. You can only test, you can only call, basically think of it this way. In your test methods, you can only call the methods in the interface. That's it. It's, it's quite simple. In your testing functions, you can only call the internal, from the internal project code, the, the, the functions listed in the interface. Uh, Justin, the answer is yes. That is a, um, oh, no, hold on. Get channel details. Is that a, oh, you guess you're giving just an example, right? Um, if get channel details is a, was a function in the specification, then, um, no, well, your question, so I don't know if everyone can see Justin's question in the chat. Yeah. The question doesn't really quite make sense. Get channels details sounds like a function. So if that was a function in the specification, um, so if it was like, you know, get all channels V1, and then I can go, you know, does result one equal to blah, blah, blah. That's completely valid. But if you are, if you go into the data store and go, you know, data store of channels one, this is white box and this is breaking. Um, Wacken, so does the same go for channel tests? Like type channel channel is an int. Does that count as white box? Even though in the specs, it states that it should return an int. That counts as an int, it, the, again, same as this. Like if I, if here I checked, you know, assert type result of, you know, the first one is an int or whatever the, 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 the syntax is, I'm still testing that it returns an int, but I'm testing it via the interface API. If I did it here, that would be white box. What's the difference between calling our own data creation function and a fixture? Great question. Very nuanced question. There are two ways of doing the same thing, basically. So get channel is the return from channel details function. Oh, this, this function. But it doesn't return get channels. It returns like this. Thing, right but um, oh yeah Jake the handle generated from registration is stored as a string right the handle generated from registration so let's see right so auth register 
returns. Is that what you mean? Where is it? Comment, I'm gonna highlight it. Or is there another register that you're talking about? Can you clarify that? Um, Ricardo is answering Justin's question. That's good. Okay. If the function is implemented in a try except, how do we test that an exception is raised? We covered that in a previous lecture, but basically PyTest has some helpers to test that an exception was raised. So please go back and watch. Um, where was it? It was in this video, I think. Here we go. Python exceptions. There you go. Um, it's spoken about here. Okay. Um, got it. Thank you. Okay. Awesome. Fixtures cannot call our own helper functions. They can only call functions in the spec. Correct. Correct. Otherwise that's just like having code in the function that calls helper functions. Whew. What time is the Thursday auto testing? Kevin, do you mean for the leaderboard? I think you mean the leaderboard. I think Emily's got it running. I've just asked Emily what time she's got the leaderboard configured to run. So maybe she replies quickly. Maybe she doesn't. <laughs> we'll see. I think it was 9 a.m. last term. It should be 9 a.m. this term again. Okay, um, Stephen, is your query can... Okay, 10 a.m. Yeah, 10 a.m. every morning. I think. One more out. Cool. So it, 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 it might not be exactly on the dot. It looks like Emily actually manually runs it. So we'll run it and we run it slightly more often. Okay, we don't actually run it every single morning. We run it on Tuesday, Thursdays and Saturdays before the due date. There you go. So we run it a little bit more often right before it's due. Okay. Um, so I'm trying to understand this discussion between like Hamish and... Stephen, but maybe if someone wants to reiterate the question, they can. Um, Justin's asked, when are the help sessions available? Great question. It's always good to, to go to the help sessions. Let me, um, this is dangerous. I've got to make sure i got no messages and things that I don't want people to see on Teams. Um, let me show you here. I mean, so hopefully you've all seen this before. So on Teams, if you go to Comp 1531, you go to the Help Sessions tab, you click the Schedule, and you'll see the live schedule for the Help Session. So you can see there's a Help Session today at 6 o'clock. And so you just come here, and you can just join this meeting when it's on. And that's when all the Help Sessions are on during the week. Cool. So 6, six o'clock. Um... Um, you don't call fixtures within the function. That's not how fixtures work. We'll talk about fixtures in a later lecture. Fixtures are automatically called, basically, when the function is called. Okay, Stephen solved his problem. Fantastic. Um, you've all seen... You all should know how to get the help session schedule, so I'm going to get rid of my teams. Um, Alrighty, and now it's 406. I need a stretch. You guys need a stretch, I'm sure. I hope... Um, like always, you learnt a lot. Again, please um, use the the link. Here we go. 
for lecture feedback, um, anything that, um, any issues you've got about the project that I maybe didn't cover well enough in this lecture or I skipped over or anything like that, the best thing to do is post on the forum. That's when you'll get um, the best correct answer for these sort of project specific questions. If you look at the forum, um, you'll see we've got um, 56. Yeah, the, the forum's getting used a lot now. You can see there's already a bunch of, for, of project related questions. We will get to them all. Um, uh, so that's the best thing you can do to get to get the best help for that. Um, yeah, otherwise, I hope you enjoyed the, 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 the content yesterday and today. Um, what have we got next week on the schedule? Let's see. No, that's the wrong one. No, wrong link. Uh, we've got, so today was week three. I put the PDF links up. Oh, I didn't do that in advance. Oh, you can, you can get all the, I don't know if this was clear. I need to maybe, I might, I might even just, do you guys, are you guys happy if I like delete this column? <laughs> Cause I have to manually update every single link. All the PDFs are just here. Um, <laughs> so, so, um, Anyway, what do we got next week? Week four. Oh, yeah, next week's exciting. We're talking about HTTP. That's exciting. Um, but yeah, good luck getting the project in. Remember, though, that iteration one is the smallest weighted project. You will get better and better um, with the project and getting it all working. Um, so that's really, really exciting. Um, but really work hard on iteration one. You know, every, I know you guys know this, but every mark helps get as many of the testing part tests passing as you can. I'm really excited to talk about HTTP, um, next week, but keep in mind that the HTTP stuff is all for iteration two, not iteration one. So, um, yeah, I hope you're all having a lot of fun. You're learning lots. You're getting your hands stuck into a real project. It's really exciting. I'll see you guys all on Wednesday, Tuesday next week at the lecture. See you everyone. Have a great, have a great day. Stay dry, stay safe, please. Um, and I'll be in touch about um, if we are changing more online, changing more in-person tutorials to online. See you everyone.